Oh my gosh. Guys. What? Oh, look at that. What is that? That's a gum boot. The cold blue water of the Salish Sea is unlike anything I have ever seen. It's an intricate maze of waterways scattered with various island chains, and beneath the surface, a kingdom of animals that are seldom encountered. I'm gonna touch it, you ready? Mm -hmm. However, if you find yourself along its incredible stretch of shoreline, or even better, on the edge of one of its many islands, you stand the chance of coming across intertidal marine animals. Today, the crew and I will be venturing by way of both the uninhabited Doe Island. A satellite landmass adjacent Orcas Island, it can be explored from its northernmost point to its southernmost point in under 30 minutes. While there are very few animals living within the interior, at low tide, the shoreline is peppered with bizarre sea creatures. So it was only a matter of looking in the right places to find some that we could get in front of the cameras. All right. It is just us and the island. Wow. It's a really cool feeling to come onto a spot that is completely uninhabited, free of humans. Anything is possible. What we're really after today is the marine life that's hiding in and amongst these rocks. Now it is low tide. As you can see, all this kelp, algae, and seagrass is going to be extremely slippery. So watch your ankles, guys. This is not the kind of place that you want to twist one and end up hobbling across this terrain. So let's go up this direction and hopefully come across some cool animals. All right, well, here's something we didn't expect. We got through all this dense underbrush, and right in the middle of the island is a trail. We should make traversing it to the other side much simpler. All right, guys, look at this. The tide is all the way back from here. That is perfect tide pooling area. I see some pockets right there filled with eelgrass. See some kelp down in there. This is gonna be perfect for finding marine creatures. All right, let's go. That's a big piece of driftwood. Whoa, this pocket's full of little snails. Look at all those little guys. Oh, look at this. What you got? I don't know if you can zoom in there. Look at that little crevice. Can you see back here? Oh, I got it, yeah, I see something there. What is that? That's called a sea lemon. Now, I can see it's got its little sensory organs out. And see that little frilly cluster in the back there? Mm -hmm. Right there? Those receptors help them sense chemicals in the environment. And that's how these creatures move about and study their environment. All right, I'm gonna get it now, you ready? Yep, go for it. Okay, real slowly here, you're gonna be very gummy. Oh, come here, buddy. All right, yep, tucked all in. And there it is. That's a sea lemon, also known as a droid. And it has very warty skin. Now, sometimes you can find these and they're real bright yellow. That's why they're called sea lemons. And they also have these very distinct little black specklings all over their backs. Does it smell like a lemon? Uh, good question. Nope, it smells like a slug. And they are related to slugs and mollusks. And if I turn it up like this, you see the underside there? There's its foot. Pretty cool, huh? Very lemony looking. Yeah, very, it's like a big gummy lemon. Look at that, just like the warty sea cat that we found in Costa Rica, it just kind of turns into a glob when you hold it in your hands. All right, you guys ready to put the sea lemon back under the log? Let's do it. Okay, oh, but before we do, I got a quick tongue twister for you, ready? All right. Not all lemons are sea lemons, but all sea lemons live in the sea. Try saying that 10 times fast. Not all lemons are sea lemons, yep, yeah, do it. Yeah, not easy, <laughs> is it? All right, here we go. Bye, little guy. Right there. Give it a second to grab on. Okay. The sea lemon may not be the most difficult animal to catch. However, finding one is said to be good luck, as they are an indicator species and signal a very healthy ecosystem. This gave me a strong sense of confidence because if the environment is free of pollutants, that means more creatures to find. What? Nothing? Ah, I thought that one's gonna yield something amazing. All right, look at this one. This is kind of neat to note. Look at how all 
of the seaweed has completely matted down and dried up in the sunlight. So underneath this is where an animal would potentially find refuge from the sun once the tide has gone out. Okay. Come on, lucky rock. Whoa. Whoa! Jeez, look at this. It is a huge prickleback. Wow, that is the biggest one I've ever seen. And this, let me look at its face. I believe this is a rock prickleback, and I can tell that based on the distinct stripe marking right there on the front of its head. Look at that, it's huge. Now you look at this creature, you're probably thinking to yourself, coyote, that's an eel, that's not a fish. As a matter of fact, it is a fish. It's not a true eel at all, despite the fact that it really looks like one. Now, it's impossible for me to completely keep this thing still. There we go, settle down right there. Now zoom in there on the head of this animal, Mark. Okay. You see those distinct stripes? I do. That's how I was able to identify it as a rock prickleback. There are several prickleback species in this area, but this is the largest. And this may look big to you and me. This is the biggest one I've ever caught, but they can grow to be about three feet in length. Oh man. Yeah. So Coyote, is it slimy or is it slippery? It's What's it like? It's incredibly slimy and slippery. And here's something really cool about these pricklebacks. They can actually breathe air. They breathe underwater with their gills. And then when the tide goes out, they can stay out of the water for several hours breathing air. Now notice that ridge that runs along its back, that dorsal spine that has little tiny spikes on it. And I can feel that kind of like the fins of a bluegill and it's not sharp enough to necessarily prick me, but they use that to help themselves balance when swimming underwater. So Coyote, these fish, can they dry out? Because we found them out of water, like there's no water under these rocks. Well, they can't dry completely out. So if it was sitting out on a rock in the sun, that would obviously kill it. But underneath the rock, even if there's no water, they can secrete a mucus from their skin. That keeps them wet and slippery. Now, I do keep dipping it into the water. Here, watch this. So if I just kind of keep its head cupped and dip it in, that allows it to stay cool and moist. And I think at this point, it's probably safe to say we can release this prickleback back off into the ocean. You ready? Good idea, let's do it. Watch it swim out of my hand. There he goes. All right, let's keep searching. With what seemed like an endless supply of smaller rocks to carefully search beneath, we also found ourselves maneuvering over and around massive boulders that were exposed by the low tide. While these massive rock structures would not be possible to overturn, searching for animals in their crevices was a perfect place to look. Oh, a good shaded spot here. Look, this is still wet and slippery. Oh, look at that right there. See that? That's rock? a chitin. Nope, that's a chitin. It looks like a barnacle or part of the rock. That's actually a mollusk. Hold on a second. I'm gonna see if I can gently get it off here. They really suction on the rocks. We got it. Coming off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. There we go. Whoa, look at the underside of that thing. Yee. Looks just like the foot of a slug, doesn't it? So They're, it's not a barnacle. No, it's not a barnacle. This is a mollusk. They're related to slugs and snails. Now, this is a small species. I'm not sure which species. If you look at the back there, you see all these armor plates that run down the center. Those are called vents. And believe it or not, the largest species of chitin lives in this area. And that's honestly what I'm hoping we come across today. The tide is low enough. It's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time and finding the right series of rocks. All right, I'm gonna place this one right back here in the shade. There we go. All right, let's keep moving. I try to find the giant gumboot. Gum what? Gumboot chitin. So far, aside from the prickleback, everything we were finding was rather small. That is until I jumped between two boulders and found myself in the land of giants. A lot of hermit crab. Oh, what's that? What's a little sea cucumber again? Oh my goodness, look at this. What? Oh, look at the size of that sea star. Whoa. And it's purple. What? Have you ever seen a sea star that big before? No, I've never seen one that purple either. Wow. That is a first for me. I think that could be our star. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Guys. What? This is one thing I'd hope we'd find. Is there a bigger one? No, 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 no. Look at this. Ah, I got it, I got it. Oh, look at that. What is that? That's a gumboot. What's a gumboot? It's a chitin. It is actually a type of mollusk related to snails and slugs. And I think between the two of these, we have found our feature creatures. All right. 
actually the tide is starting to come back in at this point. Let's move up a little ways and get these two up close for the cameras. Woo, this is awesome. Woo, how'd we do? I would say that was quite possibly the most successful tide pool adventure we have ever had. Now most of the animal species that we found, we showed you quickly and then we released them right back into the wild. But our two feature creatures, we just had to take some time to get up close for the camera. Now I'm gonna reach into the bucket here. I did bring a bucket just in case we found something that was worth holding on to for a little bit of time. You, Are can you, guys... see, you can see the tide is, is all in there. Yeah, the tide is coming back in pretty quickly so we only have a few minutes with these animals. But if you're ready, let's go for the first one. You set? Let's see him. Okay, here we go. This is the largest sea star I have ever seen. Look, he's got algae and kelp all over his little tube feet there. And it's purple. It is purple. Now, I will give you one guess as to what type of sea star this is. Wait, here's a hint. What color is it? Great. <laughs> Close. And a good guess, it is a purple sea star. And this is one of the largest species that you can find off the Pacific coast. And honestly, it is the biggest sea star I have ever handled. Look at this thing. All right, I'm gonna gently peel off a little bit of this kelp and algae from its tube feet. And yeah, clean you up here, buddy. Now I'm gonna turn it and let's look at the underside. Check this out. See all these little white things that look like spaghetti noodles? Those are called tube feet. Now they have thousands of these and they're used to slowly move over the surface of rocks when they're underwater. And actually, believe it or not, I say slowly move over rocks. When a sea star needs to, it actually can travel pretty quickly. Now, aside from movement, these tube feet are also used to help them catch and consume their prey. Now, what they primarily feast on are mollusks and clams. And what they will do, is, let's say my hand is a mollusk, right? You know how they close up in their shell like this? What it will do is completely engulf the mollusk, wrap its arms around, and then use all of its power to peel the shell slightly open. Then they take their mouth, they actually evert their mouth and stomach, right? So that means that their mouth and stomach comes out of the center of their body. They release digestive enzymes into their prey. It breaks down the prey's body, right? So it essentially kills them, poisons them, and then they're able to suck all that delicious flesh into their mouths and they have a meal. And you wanna know something really gross? After they've consumed their food, they actually poop it right back out of that same hole. Ew. Mouth and butt right in the same spot. Ew. How crazy is that? That's disgusting. Totally disgusting, but what an interesting tide pool creature. And without question, the largest sea star I have ever seen. Now, I know in past episodes of Beyond the Tide, we've shown you guys the little bat stars and a couple of smaller species, but this thing is about as big as my face. Now, one cool thing that we do know about sea stars is that if they lose a limb, it can regenerate. So let's say it gets stuck in a rock or a bird or some other sort of predator comes in and bites off one of these legs, it's not gonna kill the sea star. It's called caudual autonomy and it will eventually grow that limb back. Now this is a very common species up and down the Pacific coast and they're pretty simple to find when the tide is at its absolute lowest. Pretty cool, huh? The purple sea star. Purple sea star. All right, I'm gonna put this back into the bucket and let's bring out our big star. You ready for this? All right, guess number two, let's do it. All right, let me get it out of here. Whoa. Look at that. This is, in my opinion, one of the most bizarre creatures we could have come across. Kind of reminds me of the black sea hare, but it's not as squishy. Now, this chitin is very unique amongst other chitin species because I'm gonna turn it this way. Now the one that we showed you earlier had these distinct valves that ran across the length of the back. They're kind of like armor plating. Now this variety does also have those valves, but they're covered in this thick, rugged skin. This skin is called the girdle. Now, you're probably thinking, what does that feel like? Is it real slimy? It's not. Go ahead, Mark, put your hand out there and touch the back of that chitin. It's like, a, it's like an elephant or something. It is, it feels like an elephant or rhinoceros skin. Now this is very tough, very durable, not only helps keep them camouflaged, but also protects them against potential predators. Now this one is red. We saw some smaller ones earlier and they were like brown. Yeah, that's true. And this red coloration 
I don't know exactly why it's red. You would think maybe it stays in kelp and perhaps that's what keeps the camouflage. Kelp is kind of this reddish orange coloration. Um, they do feed on primarily algae. So I don't know, that tough skin though, definitely is going to defend it against any potential predators. So what part am I looking at? Is there a head? Is there a, Oh yeah, let's, let's, let's look at the anatomy of the gum boot. It's very strong, so I can only kind of hold it open there. Now, just like a slug, they have a foot that's right in the middle here. Okay. That, that big area down there. And they also have a mouth, which is tucked in underneath here. And inside that mouth is a radula. Now, radula is kind of like a scrapey tongue, right? It's covered in these little teeth, and they use that to drag across rocks where they feast on algae, which is their primary source of food. So this is an herbivore. Now, behind these flaps, you see these right here? Uh -huh. They have gills, just like a brown or a black sea hare. Uh, we can't expose those. I'd have to actually peel them back, and I don't think it will be too happy if I do that, but they use those to breathe underwater. Now, most chitin species are capable of really suctioning onto rocks. This species, though, actually is not able to hold on very tightly, so oftentimes rough waves will peel them from the rocks, and you'll see them washed up on shore like this, just facing upright, and unfortunately, they aren't able to flip over, and they bake in the sun and die. So, we definitely need to return this creature back to the water and hopefully up underneath a big strong rock. But they could actually live out of water for quite a while, right? Uh, they can, and as long as they stay positioned downward like this and flatten out their bodies, they can stay out of water for a considerable amount of time. So are they like a hedgehog in the sense they can curl up in a ball like that, or? Well, that's a good question. Well, we know hedgehogs are mammals. This is not a mammal, this is a mollusk. And they can curl up to about there, right? It's not gonna curl completely into a ball, but what it's doing right now is protecting its foot, its mouth, and its gills, which are right behind these flaps here. And I guess these must be parapodia, just like a black sea hare has very soft, kind of flexible parapodia. These are very dense, very tough muscles right there. So it basically can curl up into like a Pac-Man shape. Yeah. Pretty much. You look at it from the side there, that's like a giant Pac-Man. Also kind of looks like an alien creature that would maybe suction onto your face, but it's not going to do that. Good news for me. They also do not bite, so I have nothing to worry about. They are not venomous. They are not poisonous. This is a completely safe species to handle if you happen to find one in the tide pool. So Coyote, how rare is a gum boot? That's a good question. I have never come across a gumboot before, and I've come across many chitin species. The only time you'll find these giants is when the tide has receded out to its lowest interval. That allowed us today to get up underneath some big rocks, and that's where I found this guy and got up close for the cameras. Definitely one of the coolest creatures that we have featured on Beyond the Tide. Now, this is the largest chitin species in the world, and they can grow to be 14 inches in length and weigh as much as four and a half pounds. How about that for a giant? So what eats these? Does anything eat one of these? Um, small crabs will eat along the edges of this animal's body, but from what marine biologists have observed, it doesn't seem to necessarily injure or distract this creature from moving along the ocean floor. So it doesn't have a whole lot of predators, what you're saying? No, but here's an interesting fact that you may not know. The gumboot is actually edible if you're a human. Ooh. Believe it or not, in a worst case scenario, let's say you're stranded on an island and you've run out of coconuts and crabs and you find a gumboot, this internal fleshy area is edible. Although I have to imagine it would taste pretty gross. I mean, just that name, gum boot, I'm imagining it's like eating a very chewy boot that probably has the taste of disgusting ocean water. Well, wow. we're, we're headed back to shore tonight, so we're gonna have pizza. Yeah, I'm gonna eat pizza tonight and not a gum boot. Well, I would definitely say that this was one epic excursion, exploring Doe Island, where we came across more marine species than we've ever featured on an episode of Beyond the Tide. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Oh, look at this. The tide is coming back in, which means it's time to put the animals back into the ocean. Exploring along the shoreline of Doe Island, we came across some fascinating marine animals. Species like the gumboot chitin and purple sea star are rarely exposed. So it's only when the tide is at its absolute lowest that creatures like this can be encountered and safely admired. If you come across either of these two in the wild, remember that they are completely harmless. However, it's always best to simply admire them from a respectful distance so that you do not disturb their natural behavior cycle. Hey Coyote Pack, 
Have you picked up your tickets for the Brave Adventures Tour yet? There's only a few left, so make sure to click on this link to reserve your seats today. And remember, the tour is the only place you can find one of the exclusive Golden Adventure tickets. And don't forget, subscribe so you can join me and the crew on our next big adventure. I am so proud to have written this book and it was inspired by a lot of the adventures that we have had.